singing. We started from the tonal note. So, so then after that we will uh, move towards the main phrases. That is around the uh, around the tonal note. Basic note. And these phrases so. are given, or you learn them from your guru, or where do yes, you come? Yes, we we learn from the guru, and they are well defined uh, phrases, and uh, being followed through centuries. So. Uh, I won't go how how old a rag is because uh, as uh, he said in the morning that uh, we cannot say because uh, really the uh, actual Shruti, Swara, etc. were so much different and I, what might have um, gone through the ages we do not know. But right now we, say, we can say that for 100 years we are singing uh, rag Yaman in certain way which has been uh, documented by Pandit Hathandi and we are following that. So, in that case, uh, there are certain phrases. We uh, start the rag by uh, tonal sa, and then we will sing the main uh, notes of the uh, rag, which is around tonal sa. We we'll just don't go ascending and descending to the scale. We, uh, uh, we mostly do not uh, accept this mathematical uh, I mean, combination and permutation of the scale. We go through the phrases. And that only makes a rag more, uh, you know, concrete. It gives a character to the rag, and uh, an identifiable character. So first, we will uh, say for uh, five minutes we do alapana uh, towards the uh, node, uh, I mean, tonal swara sa and around it, and then we will start singing the slow-paced uh, khayal, the uh, composition. And after taking the composition, we will gradually go to uh, the Tarsa. And this is the process we follow. So, and so basically for a given rag, how many phrases you are conscious of using? Maybe there is one main one? We are not conscious. We are not at all conscious of how many phrases. Like, but say, uh, if we... Uh, I am taking the example of Rag Yaman. We, we know that uh, uh, here we are going to use uh, Thivrama, Shapma, Masha. So, uh, and uh, we started from Nirega, is a um, common phrase. Then again, Nirega Ma pa, pa, pa Resa. This is another phrase which is uh, when, uh, you know, uh, identifiable phrase uh, for Rag Yaman. And then Madhanisa to go to the higher octave. These are the uh, uh, stated phrases, but in between how you take it, uh, that creates the actual uh, character, I mean, mood of the rag. We cannot uh, just uh, go on uh, I mean, uh, singing the notes as for notes, say like, Nirega Parisa. It can uh, it can be common to many uh, many ragas which have these kind of uh, phrases. What he said that we can keep all those ragas in a one basket, and uh, we can say that it is kalyananga ragas. But to uh, to say that I am singing uh, rag yaman particularly, we have to sing it the way it it is sung through the phases and uh, with the help of the particular graces, etc. Um, in Carnatic music, um, ragas are basically, the motives are got from learning compositions. Compositions are the biggest uh, bank for learning, for learning, understanding motives. So, um, every guru will teach the student as many compositions types of compositions in a certain raga and through the process you will you will recognize different motives some very repeated motives so these are internalized in fact it's these these are never taught as in you're never told that these are the motives for this raga okay you learn compositions and in the process you have to be able to internalize these motives now the question of improvisation is a challenge because you have to create motives. Basically, that's what you need to do. You don't create permutations, but you have to create motives between the standard motives. So, 
Um, the first thing that needs in the process is internalization of these motives have been complete. Mm. So there is no point of the time that you are actually thinking whether you are seeing the Praga. In fact, conscious thought should be absent. Mm. Only if conscious thought is absent, absent can improvisation actually take place. Mm. As long as there is conscious thought, there is never going to be improvisation. So the first process is to internalize the motives which you gain, get. And in fact, initially you will find a lot of students only singing the motives. You ask them to sing the raga, they only sing the motives, which is absolutely fine. So you just let them sing the motives. And then through a period of time, when if you say sing this raga, from there move to another raga, it can be done very easily because you've internalized the motives. Slowly you'll see small phraseology creeping. That is when the artist is actually creating, is, is say linking established motives with their own possibilities. Now whether this their own possibilities have, has ever been sung before is not the question. Is it a unique phrase that has never been rendered by any musician? I don't think it's the problem at all. It very well could have been rendered by another musician. But the fact that it was a motive that came from this artist through, through established motives still makes it a very, very concrete example of improvisation. That's why I said improvisation needs to be nuanced because every phrase need not be a, something out of, the, out of the moon that nobody has heard before. So this is the process of, of improvisation. Whether it is an alapa, alapna, or whether it is, and also depends on the determinants of what type of improvisation you're doing, also affects the methodology of process of developing. Now, the way I would develop, I mean, I would, I would, the approach I would use to improvise in a different improvisation technique as Kalpana Sora or Nerval will be different. But the basis of the Raga internalization and the lack of conscious thought cannot be uh, removed. So I have a question. Yeah, okay. So I think for, uh, for uh, uh, the, I mean, we are running late, so there is not much time to, to discuss. So let's open the, the, the floor for questions and uh, we can finish uh, with that. So please. I just have a question uh, for Krishna. We are uh, we are looking at uh, while while looking at the compositions and alapanas and all plotting the pitch contours and all. We were looking at gamakas as the basic uh, structure for identification or uh, whatever. But you say that breaking a phrase into a, its compositional its composition of gamakas is pretty difficult because it contains a lot of gamakas. Then what would be the next formalized mode of recognition that we can choose, or what do you think would be such? Well, a I was actually telling uh, Dr. Murthy on lunch today. I think. The best way forward would be um, recognizing, I mean, I was given a, a, a way of doing it actually. I said, suppose you get 10 people to come and sing one raga. Choose a raga, ask them all to sing it. Then extrapolate from those 10 renditions, those phraseologies that are common. You will definitely find at least 50 phrases that are common among all these 10 musicians. So you use that as your database and work on that first. Work on those 50 phrases to be the IDs for that raga. Okay? You can go a step further. You can also look for distinct phraseologies. I mean, this actually this, this uh, data you collect will give you a lot of resource to look at over, overlaying phraseologies, phraseologies that are distinct in these 10 musicians that they have not repeated, and then try working. So first would be get common phraseology for a raga. Because you will find at least 50 phrases everybody sings in this raga. Work with that first, and then see if you can create any identification using that. Then you will also you could also see what happens if a phrase which is not there appears. Is there something that that your software is willing to pick up out of the known phrase itself to give it an ID? Then you should look at another raga that has common phraseology but also distinct phraseology, and see how there is an interaction between these distinct phrases and the common phrases. Because this is what actually makes X raga different from another, which has same phrases. So you have two ragas having the same phrase, but having another phrase that is different. right? So this interrelationship between the unknown phrase and the known phrase is what differentiates X from Y. So this interrelationship point, the point of intersection between these two, is what actually determines the change. So that point of intersections are, are I think, critical to identify with whether you are here or there. Just at this point, 
I want. I wonder uh, what level then you can make a segmentation into, let's say, regas and the clients associating the, the two. Oh, good point. <laughs> and it's a very well. That's that's the biggest. That's the toughest one. How bad you segment? No, that is that is the challenge. So um, if you, I mean, I've said take 50 phrases, but you could cut those 50 phrases in totally different ways than I do. But I think there are certain phrases which are identified as you know a stamp for that product. Okay, those pretty much everybody knows stands for it. So you could get a good sampling out of it. But I agree with you. I agree with you. The problem does exist that you could probably have a bigger sample. Or the same phrase could be extended and say this is the phrase and not that the phrase. That is the yes. point. But yeah, the second issue is: is there an ambiguity uh, of assigning one phrase to one raga or the other if the rate that are coming phrases? That's what I said. So in those cases, I think the point the point where it transforms itself to the next raga. See, there is a phrase X. No phrase. Some phrases by itself will identify with the raga. Some phrases will identify with the raga depending on what comes before it or after it. Right? So the point of intersection between what is coming after it and or what is coming before it is what actually makes the transformation. You know? So uh, for those kind of phrases, you need to know the transform point. You will need to know what is it that is making it. It's not just the note changing, it is also the movement sometimes. You will have to see whether you can identify that movement. Okay, if, if you would make this if you would ask two different expert musicians to do the same task, yeah. Uh, yeah. would you end up with the same segment? I you think, not, yeah. you, you know where you will not, where you will, I can tell you. I can assure you that if you get 10 top musicians and ask them to give you 10 phrases in Raga X, 7 will be the same. If you ask me, give me 7 phrases that identify with this Raga. I can tell you out of 10, at least 6 or 7 will be more or less the same phrase. More or less known phrases, known phrases. Okay, but then the point of change is where you will find a lot of differences because it is contextual. It is contextual on where it is used, at what mode it's used, at what speed it's used. And the basis. Yeah, I mean. But uh, I'm asking about the analysis of existing recording. So there, there is the recording, yeah. and you ask the musician. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you ask, if you give a, a, a if you give five musicians a recording of X raga sung by somebody and ask them to pick out the classic motives of the raga, I'm pretty sure at least out of, uh, if you ask them for 10, 6 or 7 will be common. Only, I'm talking about only identifiable classic phrases, not improvisational classic phrases. They will be, they will be pretty common, I'm quite certain. Yes, uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, yes. In the process of learning a student actually uh, get an abstract picture or abstract structure of the motives, and then he then there is a possibility of improving it. Sorry, I, I didn't write. Uh, so, so in the process of learning, so in the process of learning by by a student, we <coughs> actually get an abstract structure of these motives, and that that's what you will do. So you are asking about a student. Yeah, a student a student learns the abstract structure of the. See, the student gets learns the motives through compositions. Okay, and it's only through compositions that you understand these motives. That is what you get. So now that's your database. The question is how are you going to, how, how is your mind using this database to re, I mean, I, I to not recollect music but recreate music. I, I always prefer to use the word that your mind recreates music. So from the abstract, abstract structure he has, he actually recreates uh, something. Yeah, why I say recreate is because when you, uh, when you recollect you're talking about just giving what is taken. But when you recreate, Depending on how much more your mind is absorbed, every time it, it recreates that melodic line, it actually gives you a different color for the melodic line. That's part of improvisation. So that, that data is very important. That's why the more compositions you know in a raga, your confidence level of performing at raga is more. Because you have more in your head, simple as that. So my question is uh, for Professor Murthy. So uh, uh, in transition, actually, uh, you, uh, you, you 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 actually tried uh, separating out two uh, two instruments, right, out of a composition. So is it possible, or 
uh, have any work been done on the part where you know the multiple uh, instruments are playing and they are trying to separate out all the? At least there is claim that it has been done in the western uh, classical side, okay. but uh, we have not really uh, attempted it. And this was our first experiment done this two weeks back. I see. So we have a lot more work to do on that. But seems to be an exciting, I mean, from a single crossing perspective, right. it's a very exciting uh, uh, area to get into. Rather than just looking at, because I think, uh, I think I feel you know, more I listen to it. In Indian classical, it's not just intonation alone; it's also the harmonics which <coughs> play quite an important role, and also the energy in each uh, harmonic, which perhaps uh, adds color to the particular note. And I feel that's why we should look at. Time to do some others, and that's the reason I think we should look at it. I mean, I said only very preliminary. I have no. Uh, okay. It's not at all scientific, really tested, no end full cross validation or anything like that. Yeah, so so because I was just uh, wondering, can we use some machine learning techniques to you know train so our classifiers? Actually, I would uh, refer you to Gautam Mysore and uh, Vishraj of CMU, I do from Adobe, who've done a lot of work on music separation. If you're interested, I mean. Our idea is not primarily, I mean, if you notice the separation was pretty bad. But what I'm interested is, suppose I separate it out, then do the pitch contour and then do the yeah. numerous histograms. See, problem is, I'm always going to get a uh, performance. I can't get, uh, I have Vignesh now, so he will just sing for us whatever we are asking to do without accompanying the instruments. But normally what you're going to hear in a concert is with all these instruments. And then what happens is your pitch extraction algorithms go pretty haywire. So the whole idea is if I can do the separation, then I can do much better pitch extraction on the uh, individual. That's, that was the primary reason. And they, there are better still if there are time frequency masks. Maybe I can, I don't even need to. That was the segmentation and then doing that. That was the primary reason. Uh, is there an extended version of what, what you showed on the slide? Like the, there was an NMF. Yeah, there is a, there are two things. This probabilistic, uh, I've forgotten. Let's see, letting mm -hmm. semantic index. There, there, both these techniques are uh, mm -hmm. available. Of course, they are in Wikipedia if you're interested. And uh, better other papers by Vishraj does the probabilistic LSC, LSI, or LSP, LC, sorry. And uh, Mysore does the NMF. If you look at Wikipedia, it gives you references to all these people. Vikshiraj and Gautam Mysore are the two people who have been doing with music in particular. It has been doing, used quite extensively in speech recognition. And uh, so, yeah, speech recognition has been quite extensively used. The uh, non negative mathematics uh, factor. So, it's something just worthwhile looking So, there are the other uh, cats in the field. Also, uh, Professor Rao, uh, you, you could uh, just tell, tell us a little about what we, uh, what experiments have been done uh, in separating out tabla and harmonium. Yeah, actually, I think that is a little uh, outside what we start, so we can talk later yeah, about sure. it. I don't know how much of the focus of the group is not very clear. Can you please highlight it for the benefit of everybody? <laughs> <laughs> what are they being spoken about? <laughs> The purpose of the group of this. The group. focus of the group at this juncture, you know, at this point of time. Which group? Oh. No, the, the, in the calm music and the reason for this workshop and this is a good opportunity yeah, to close and to yeah. summarize and to close the, the session. The reason why we're here now and we're going to be in June in Turkey and uh, then I'm going to be next month in China is to basically understand understand the issues, have ec experts in every culture that can help us understand the issues and with the confrontation between the tools that we know how to how, how to what to do and the, the, the research issues that uh, we can handle see if we can help in uh, solving <coughs> some relevant issue that can be of interest to practitioners to listeners and develop technologies that can help these musics to get a, a for people to understand better some of these issues as we don't understand now. So right now, as you saw, there were some clear issues on pitch analysis, on rhythm analysis, on intonation that we're focusing on, and hopefully that will give some insight into some of these music. Even hopefully we might even maybe be able to detect 
some motivic issues and some relationships that happen in the music that even musicians are not conscious about because as you said a lot of these things is you have you cannot be conscious about it and that's the whole purpose of it but i think it's also nice to a posteriori to do an analysis and and try to see these relationships and why a piece of music is so much interesting than another one why an improvisation of a great master uh, gives uh, so much emotion and so much communication compared with another one. So our approach is to understand, humbly understand these issues, and humbly try to find our knowledge, bring it to it, and with our technology to help all this music uh, continue to be great and evolve. <coughs> Can I ask if yes. time permits? Sir, actually, when uh, we were trying to uh, look, uh, look at the paper of uh, one, uh, uh, we found that when uh, whatever the things we are seeing as waveform, when we hear it, sometimes it may sound different. That is, if at all gamakas, for example, for gamakas where what, uh, rhythm was changed, then we see the waveform little bit slowed down, but we hear different sounds. Is uh, whether we can get some explanation on that? I don't part? understand your question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so if at all one gamakas on the Buddha Devji's uh, demonstrations where the yeah. tan tempo was changed, yeah, 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 he yeah. said that some notes start sounding inaccurate. <laughs> right. No, no, that is because uh, particularly for this uh, experiment, I tell that actually mm -hmm. there was a falter which human ear cannot listen at point of performance on such a high speed. There was a falter. Yeah. To, uh, for a fraction of a second, you may feel that there was something missing, but you can't actually pin it down. But when you slow down it, without changing the pitch, uh, you slow down the thing, and uh, then you can find out actually what happened, and also you can notate how the uh, tan, at that point of time, what what tan he has taken, what sardam he has taken during that time. But my doubt is, if at all the rhythm is changed, whether the pitch will change. That no, 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 change the right, uh, rhythm speed. then uh, we can hear that in between what actually you are not changing the rhythm with the, the thing which yeah, is changing the speed you are only uh, changing the tempo or speed uh -huh. okay and there is another feature where you can actually uh, change the speed as well as the pitch of the song okay. see there is another aspect to this is certain movements have to are, are melodic in certain paces. Yeah, okay, it's very very important. Yeah. When you reduce the pace, mm -hmm. you may think it is bass. So, yeah. in, in, in Carnatic music, you will come across some movements where if you reduce the pace, the, the movement will start hanging. Mm -hmm. That's the word I can use colloquially. Mm -hmm. In the sense, the movement because the movement is not touching two notes perfectly yeah. in its in its movement itself. It is not going to two pure notes and coming back. So it is somewhere in between. So if you slow that down, what will happen? Yeah, that's, that's okay, right. so it's not an error. Yeah. Huh, yeah. That should be understood. It's not an error. Right. It is the melodic quality of that movement. The musician knows at what speed that melodic movement has to be rendered huh, right. to make it sound like appropriate to the raga and to that movement. You will never find that melodic movement being extended beyond its yeah. aesthetic possibility. Mm -hmm. That is the master musician. In fact, we've done some experiments on slowing it down. Uh, no, and as soon as you slow it down, it sounds basic. Yeah. Uh -huh, that Absolutely. is also there. Because and because then, uh, if at all, um, for example, in that paper, it was uh, there that vibrato, if at all, little bit it is slowed down. Uh, actually, in vibrato, we will hear the average sound. That is, if, uh, in the morning also, you gave the example that if at all it is riga or uh, uh, Rigama, it, it should be the average, uh, this thing like. No, I didn't say it was an average. So the mean can be anywhere. Like she said, yeah. the mean need not be the center point. It depends on the movement and the movement. Right. So if I all that is slowed down, whether <laughs> then that will be uh, different? See, different from what? Uh, from the... If it is slowed down, I think she wants to say that uh, it will sound like an andolan. Yeah. Where you will actually See, uh, hear rega, rega, rega. Obviously, if it is a if it is a if it is a gamaka that is of that nature, 
that can transform into an extension. Of course, it will transform its, its position. But if it is a gamaka that does not touch two rigas, is in between ri and ga, and you slow it down, then it will be left hanging in between ri and ga and sound basu. Okay, so I think we should uh, end here. So, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. I would like to especially thank uh, KIIT uh, for uh, allowing us to do this workshop. And maybe if you want to say uh, some words uh, to close. Uh, we have a small uh, token of appreciation for all of you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Kazi, this is a here. Okay. 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 Okay.